Great to see you. Great to um, be aware of your presence down below. Hello down in the crypt. Um, we're starting a series on Sunday nights called The Advent Conspiracy. And I know it's only November and it feels like kind of almost summer, doesn't it? It's jolly warm. Um, but Christmas is coming and we want to do something different as a church this year. And we're, we're going to be using our Sunday evening slots to talk about how we as rich Christians in a rich country can do something different so that instead of Christmas being the, the kind of material fest where we celebrate the gods of Western Europe, like eating a lot, drinking a lot, partying a lot, spending a lot on material goods for ourselves, we could think how we can do Christmas a little bit more in the spirit of Jesus who came into the world with nothing in a manger in Bethlehem, on the run, homeless, refugee, somebody who needed help, actually, became that powerless. And so that's where we're going to go. Um, we'll be thinking about how we can do some practical things together. But I want to give a bit of a biblical background tonight. And we're also going to be in Mark's gospel quite a lot as we do this. And tonight I'm going to be picking up on Mark chapter 10, which is well-known story, someone's called the, the, the rich young ruler. He's certainly wealthy, this lad. And um, here we go. Reading from verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone digression from me, irritating joke that I have when people say to me, I say, how are you? They say, I'm good. I say, you're not good. Only God is good. Because I'm quoting that verse. You know, but that's why and it's a joke, really. But, um, and it's, a, it's an Americanism. Any Americans here tonight? God bless you. You did wonderful things with our language. Anyway. <laughs> why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. And Peter said to him, We've left everything to follow you. I'll tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields and with them persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. I think there's something in human nature which says, if I am prosperous, I somehow deserve that and I'm under the blessing of God. And we can, in, in unthinking and un irrational ways, we can feel that people who are not rich, not prosperous, who are poor, who are suffering, are different from us. We can dehumanize them in our own mind. We can say they're not quite like we are. A couple of Sundays ago, Ruth, who's sitting over here, was talking about what it felt like to have a little baby and that baby to be sick and 
not to be able to feed that baby. And as a mother, how painful it was and how passionate she was about trying to get food into her son. And yet we can have very cold hearts as we aware of women in countries that are stricken with famine whose babies are dying in front of their eyes and they can't feed them and we can fail to empathize with people who don't have very much and maybe the people who find it hardest to empathize with the poor are rich young men it's interesting, isn't it, that this guy who gets this really heavy challenge is the sort of character who is, represents the most privileged kind of person that we know on the planet today. Who is it that has the best quality of life? Probably rich young men have the best quality of life going on the planet. You know, they're the ones that have their toys, they're, they're expensive toys, and they're the ones that live for pleasure, by and large. And, you know, Western Europe, the USA, there are a lot of rich young men who dominate the culture. And culture is driven often by the spending habits of rich young men. People with disposable income who want apple stuff. Nothing wrong with that. Got a bit myself. From the, re re you know, re refurb apple, you know, but... Or, you know, who, who want the cars. I mean, if you, if you look at car adverts, who are cars aimed at and marketed at? Who are these expensive things marketed at? They're, they're marketed at blokes, aren't they? By and large. Or whatever. Anyway, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being wrong there. But I think he represents this guy. Let's, let's call him capitalism. So that's what he represents. And Jesus says to this person and about this person, it's difficult for this person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And conversely, Jesus says elsewhere, it's the poorest who are going to find it easiest to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of Luke, blessed are you who are poor at now, but great will be your reward in heaven. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Blessed are the poor in spirit, they'll see God. There's a, a real emphasis on poverty, making it easier for you to get a hold of God, and riches make it hard. And this is counterintuitive to the Jewish people, because the Jewish people have always equated prosperity with God's blessing. And that gut instinct that the Jewish people had is a gut instinct that we have. If I'm prosperous, I'm being blessed. If I'm not, I'm being punished. What have I done to deserve this, we ask? when we lose everything. But it's not as simple as that. And for the poor to, be, to find it easier to enter the kingdom of heaven isn't about the relative goodness of rich people and poor people. Poor people are not better morally than rich people. Rich people are not per se more sinful than poor people. But there is something about having riches and having the kingdom, which I'm just going to unpack. By the way, any rich young men here tonight? I've got a word for you. Christoph, that's not true. <laughs> young, yes. Um, anyway, issues around riches. Why is it hard to enter the, the kingdom of heaven if you're rich? The problem is it's hard to leave riches the call for this guy if you read it was so we have leave what you've got and come and follow what the disciples say to is we've already left what we had at their point of material blessing when they got a whopping great catch of fish and business was booming that's when they were called to leave it leave your nets come follow me but actually, it's harder to leave riches than to leave poverty, isn't it? If you've got nothing, and Jesus says, come and follow me, you've got nothing to lose and you're off. If you've got a lot, it's harder to respond to that, come, follow me. And for us, it's hard to leave riches. How hard is it to become downwardly mobile, voluntarily? 
Who's tried it? Voluntarily. One or two people have tried it. Thank you. I, I've, I've done that in my life. You know, I've taken significant salary cuts, third salary cuts. I've tried to be down only mobile. What I find, actually, I live in a community. There are 24 of us, 25 of us living together. One of our values is that we, uh, we're called to live simply. Actually, over the 15 or 16 years that we've been living in community, our standard of living has gone up and up and up. It has. It's incrementally got better. The food we eat is better than we used to. <laughs> the stuff that we've got is nicer. You know, and, and our standard of living has gone up. And I've, I've, that's, that's my story. To go the other way is tricky. And to reduce our standard of living is hard for us. It's hard for us to do that even when the survival of other people is at stake. We've got Barry and Cheryl here tonight. Just give us a wave, Barry and Cheryl. They've, um, after Bar Barry took early retirement from the police. And what Barry and Cheryl have been doing, they've been going on mercy ships, caring for some very poor people. They've actually probably been a bit downwardly mobile and said, actually, we want to serve poor people rather than maximise our income at the moment. So thank you for doing that. And I guess you've seen a lot of stuff and probably should be giving this talk, really, but you're not, so stay there. Um, but it is hard, you know, but, but actually for Barry and Cheryl, you will see people all the time where the difference that a bit of money makes is about survival or not. When we talk about for Ethiopia, we're talking about some thousands of pounds which will provide drinking water when in for Ethiopia, the government water supply to the villages in the region that we support ran out. And the fact that people survived with water was because for Ethiopia had dug water holes and they did it with a £70,000 budget, I think. And for, for many people, survival is what's the issue here. And if there was a bit more money, more people would survive. And we kind of know that dimly as a thought at the back of our minds. But if it was startling now, and if I said to Matt Guttridge, Matt, if you took a 50% cut in your income, five people who were going to die next year would live. There was no doubt in my mind that Matt would stomp up that money. And if they were in Bristol, in, in front of our faces, that would be true. But that's how the world is. But we find it hard to be downwardly mobile in order to give more to the poor. Actually, we find it hard to be downwardly mobile in order to save the planet. Honestly and realistically, we're in a situation where we're, we're reaching, as you, as you probably know if you've studied climate change, all that sort of point, there's a tipping point coming within the next five or so years of irreversible climate change. And the more we know about climate and environment and the impact on the human race, the more worrying it is and the more unambiguous the research. And while we've known this, our consumption of greenhouse gases and the effect on the environment has increased. It's not decreased. It's increased in a time of recession. And we find it... Hard, hard, too hard to be downwardly mobile even to save the planet because the short term stand of living that we enjoy is not something that we're willing to give up. You might say, I'm not convinced about climate change. Okay, maybe we're not totally convinced, but is it worth the gamble? And what would it mean for us to drive less, to use less power? But it's really hard for us to do that, isn't it? And in fact, there are vested interests that don't want us to do that. And we are absolutely crazy. And we look at the Eurozone. And countries like Greece, Italy, have been dramatically overspending for a long time. And, and people don't want austerity. 
it's hard to leave our riches, even when the survival of our planet, our economic systems, or other people is at stake. It's hard for us to leave riches. They grab us. We may have riches, but riches also has got us. How do we get rid of this idol in my life? How do I let go of this power? It's got me. That is a real challenge for our culture, isn't it? It's hard to leave riches. That's why it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, because so often following God means saying no to riches. Second point. Why is it hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because riches are spiritual powers. Sometimes the New Testament calls riches unrighteous mammon. It's like a god. And it's like a fallen god, like a demon, that demands worship and demands sacrifice. And it has a spiritual power over us, not just a physical power. It does have a spiritual power over us, I think. What are the sacrifices that mammon requires? It's people like the workers in the electronics industry in China. You've probably heard about them, haven't you? In huge factory buildings where they've got safety nets under the windows to stop people jumping out and committing suicide. Where they're working all the hours of the day to produce the, the latest on-demand mobile phone and where they're being charged for bed and board and lodge so they can never get free of it. It's a kind of form of economic slavery that brings people into despair. Or it might be people in the mineral mines of Congo who are going down those mines to extract rare earth metals that again go to our electronics industry to feed our desire for stuff and which they earn a pittance for and it gets on and the middleman make all the money and people die down those minds and the worship of mammon is about self-idolatry too it's about me feeling better and looking better about myself in the book of revelation mammon is represented by the great prostitute that trades on the waters that is judged the empire that is against the kingdom of our god is a military empire it's a material empire it's Babylon. And against that prostitute stands the treasure in heaven that Jesus says about in Matthew 6. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth where rust will destroy, where moth will destroy, where thieves will break in and steal. But store up treasure in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And where's our heart? Because where our heart is, that's where we're worshipping. And materialism, mammon, is a power which wants our worship. Third thing that riches do is riches harden our heart. James chapter 5 is a really salutary verse, uh, chapter for, for our time. And I'm going to read it. Listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. And as Western economists, as powerful economists, where we've stacked trade to our advantage and to the disadvantage of the producers in many nations in the developing world, we've in effect fattened ourselves in a day of slaughter. We've made it possible for us to have cheap food and cheap clothing and cheap goods while other people are going hungry and dying. And I don't know whether the imminent collapse of <laughs> Western capitalism is a judgment or not at one level, but it's been the product of greed. 
And maybe there is a cause and effect that where we pursue our idols, they will actually crumble. And down it all goes. And the reason I would want to pray about that situation, apart from my own self-interest, <laughs> is because I don't want to make it worse for the poor. But something needs to change in the way we handle money and goods. Because we harden our heart. Jesus tells a story, it's a parable, Diaries and Lazarus, you know, about a rich man, the poor man begging at his gate. And it's like the guy doesn't see him. It's like he's invisible to him. Goes past him every day while he's feasting. It's so easy for riches to harden our heart. Conversely, that means the opposite. Giving to the poor opens up our hearts to God. Because he counts giving as worship. That's why we've taken an offering in worship tonight. Giving, material giving, is about us making a sacrifice for love for someone else. As sacrifice and worship belong together, worship has always been a sacrifice. The first time the word's used in the Bible is about Abraham going to sacrifice his son Isaac. The greatest giver of all is God himself, giving his only son. And as we give back, we're worshipping God. Worship and financial giving, worship of getting rid of our stuff, part of our worship. And therefore it opens our hearts to God. And when we give to the poor, God sees in it justice. And he's a God of justice. He's always hated the pressure of the poor. The Old Testament has like a stream all the way through it. God's heart for justice and God's heart for the poor. And that's why a book about worship like Leviticus in the Old Testament is shot through about how we care for the poor. It's close to God's heart. The widows, the aliens, the orphans, the most powerless are the people that most have God's protection over them. And God wants justice. And when we open our hearts through giving, then we're opening our heart to God's justice. And, and when we give, it helps us to be like God in his character because God is incredibly generous. And we're all in receipt of God's generosity. He gives to all generously without finding fault, James says. Jesus talks about the way God pours out his blessings on the just and the unjust alike. God is incorrigibly and lavishly generous. And when we give generously, we are becoming like him, our capacity for him increases as we give. And so giving equips and forms us for the kingdom of heaven. The very currency of the kingdom of heaven is one of generosity. That's why in the early church, when they had that outpouring of the Spirit, there was no needy one among them because they just sold their surpluses and gave and made sure that there was a, a shalom. There was a kingdom blessing. It was happening on earth. All that was looked forward to in the coming age of God, it's happening now. It's happening because our hearts are being changed and we're becoming generous. So we're making sure there's no needy one among them. And the early church lived like that, not just after Pentecost. In the times of the Roman Empire persecutions, which were in the first century and, and second centuries, it was noted about how the, the Christians cared for people that no one else would care for, even their non-Christian enemies. So it's a no-brainer, is it, really? It's just hard. You know, we pick up this verse, you know, when he says to the rich young man, you know, give Sell your possessions, give the poor. Actually, it's a general statement in Luke where Jesus says that this throws out for everyone. It doesn't say become poor quite. Proverbs says, let me not be too rich. Let me not be too poor. But it says, let's not store up for ourselves big surpluses. Store up for a rainy day while other people are already being drowned in the rain. So uh, practically, what can we do? I've got a few suggestions. Balance our giving to ourselves by giving to the poor. That's what loving our neighbor as ourselves mean. When the Gospels, when Paul as well writes about love your neighbor as yourself, the context is, you know, Jesus says, because no one neglects their own body, but they feed it and care for it. Loving our neighbors ourselves is very practical. 
It's about making sure our neighbours enough to eat and drink. Healthcare and education. And it's not a bad thing to get in the habit of when we give to ourselves that we remember to balance that with giving to the poor. In, in our house, in our community house, we, we've got a little rhythm of life where we do this. We, um, once a month, on a Saturday night, we have a really top meal. It's when we gather and we kind of reinvest in our community life and in our valleys and we, we have a, usually maybe a two or three course banquet really and we, we buy nicer food and we have wine and we sit down. We, we even dress up sometimes, yeah, but it's, it's good. But the first Monday after we do that, we have a remember the poor meal and we have beans on toast and we collect for an agency or someone. Just this month, we're collecting for Fritha Woodley, who's out in Guatemala working with kids in the slums in a very dangerous and violent place. And so, you know, a little envelope goes around. We're trying to say, right, we've spent money ourselves. Let's spend some money on the poor. So there's balance and equity. A few years ago, we bought a sound system for Woodlands. And it was quite expensive. And I thought we, we needed a sound system, and it would help us to grow. But I felt for myself, I can't justify us doing that unless I remember the poor myself sometimes, because if we're spending money on ourselves. So for me, I determined from when we bought the PA that I would increase my giving to Woodlands, but earmark that giving for Tear Fund. So if we're spending money on us, we're spending money on the poor as well. And I just really want to commend that as a lifestyle practice. Whenever you spend money, think, how can I love my neighbor as well? Now, it's tricky because we live in an expensive country, but there's a lot of expensive countries around, aren't there? But there's something we can do. And so maybe this Christmas, as we think about the people we're spending money on, and maybe it'll be our family and friends that get the bulk of our giving, can we give over and above, balance our giving to ourselves so we have a nice time, to giving to people who we don't know and who will not have food and consumables at Christmas unless we're able to give. And there'll be lots of ways to giving that, but in December we'll be having an Advent Conspiracy collection. Or we might want to make it a really big one, or we want to make it give the poor. And, and if we can buy less so that we can give more, then we will be doing a kingdom thing. We spend less on ourselves so that we can give more away. That will be good. The second thing we can do in terms of um, care for the poor is get to know the poor. Um, there are poor people in Bristol. Some of them are refugees and asylum seekers who are not eligible for benefits. There's an organization called Bristol Hospitality Network, which some people in this church support, which tries to care for people like that. There are a whole bundle of Christian people working with refugees, asylum seekers in the city. Why don't we think, how can I get involved and actually get to know some poor people? Can I listen to their story? When I was... Um, younger than I am now, I'd been working for a church in Clifton. And it was a church full of people like me, young university graduates, handsome, talented. <laughs> no, that's Philip, <laughs> Philip Gennady's line. No, I can't claim that one. But um, yeah, we, we were young, prosperous people, and, and I knew that God was stirring me to do something different, and actually to care for the poor in some particular way. And having knocked a number of doors, I ended up running something called Bristol Methodist Centre, which was an inner city project. Um, for three years and just really a day center shop front church and what, what happened was I just got to know a lot of really poor people people would come into the center and they'd be carrying a plastic bag and that would be everything that they had and so I got to know the poor by name and I got to know about the reasons why their lives had turned out that way and looked at some of the damage that people had suffered in society and looked at some of the addictions that people have got into and look some of the chaos and mess that's possible to have in in our life and some of the hurt and and some of the the ways in which you know as our society was 
you know, emptying the mental hospitals and people finding their way on the street, all kinds of reasons why people would end up with very little. And I got to know poor people by name and welcomed them into my home. And it was good for me. And I think it's good for us to do that. To get to know people by name, to know their stories. And that means that we have to give time. Just tonight, actually, there's a soup run going out from Woody's, which happens regularly on Sunday nights. And you can get involved. There's all kinds of ways. But a great way to get to know people by name is to volunteer at the Wild Goose Cafe. And it's easy for you to do that. We have some staff members and coordinators here. On Wednesday nights, Woodlands Church runs the drop-in cafe, the Wild Goose and Stapleton Road. And people will come in there who need stuff to eat. I was outside, I was in Ashley Road this lunchtime, looking at the little sisters of the poor who run a food distribution there in Ashley Road. There's a great long line of people snaking at the pavement, going to get food handouts. The little sisters... <laughs> They, they, you could help them. These guys. You go down to St. Paul's and give away food, don't you? On a Friday night? Last night you did that. You could talk to Stephen and Sharon and say, what do you do? How can I support you in doing that? But let's, let's get to know poor people by name. Third thing we can do. Let's be informed about Poverty. And international justice. And it's easy to find things out. We've got the internet. It's incredible what you can find out. There are magazines, there are people here. We've, we've got someone here. For, not, Mr. Quarrel, there, will you stand up? A little wave. All right. Nigel works for Christian Aid. That's what he does for a living. He's always informing people about the poor. He would love it if you talked to him and said, how can I find out more? How can I do some stuff? How can I campaign? How can I lobby my MP? What can I do? What can I do about international justice? How can I change the way I live? That would be great, wouldn't it? Anyway, there's a lot of resources in this church. Andrew Street, just cause, cause I'll give a little wave, Andrew. Do you? Andrew does loads of stuff. Give a proper wave, Andrew. All right. And um, there are ways in which, in all kinds of things, things like microfinance, we're going to be a seminar about that in the new year. People coming down from World Vision talk to us about it, how to do that responsibly and ethically, something that actually makes a difference. Get involved. Great things to do. And um, just, just the last thing we can do is that we can make giving part of our worship. And Jesus um, commended people who gave, like the widow, you know, she just gave what she had, place of worship. David said, um, how can I make sacrifices that cost me nothing to God? Who's a man after God's own heart? And, you know, there's a chance here, Sundays, Make giving part of your worship. Maybe save up to be extravagant. Or week by week, in secret ways, say, Lord Jesus, this is not, I'm not doing this out of duty. I'm not doing it because Dave Mitchell told me to or anything like that. I'm doing this because I love you, Lord God, and I want the overflow of my love for you to touch my pocket. I want to worship you with finance. All right. That's some stuff. What I'd like, like to do. Um, is to pray in a minute. Um, I'm going to get Ruth to come and pray for us as well, just about the, the bigger picture. Yeah, I'm do, giving this talk tonight, and it wasn't planned to be doing it at a time of financial turbulence. But anybody who knows anything about economics is worried at the moment about the, the financial crisis that's enveloping the Eurozone, and that could envelop the whole world with the, with the knock-on effects, like a domino effect around the major economies of the planet. And when things go wrong, the 
poorest tend to suffer. You know, it's often rich people, even when things go wrong, have got some cushions, some mechanisms. But we could be facing in our Western Europe as well, big um, crises of lack of confidence in the economy, a shrinking economy, a recession, people losing their jobs, um, you know, devaluations of currency, a whole range of things that could make life really tricky unless you want to go on holiday in Greece. There's all sorts of problems that are facing us, potentially. And part of how we want to pray is that the poorest do not suffer in those sort of times. And that when everything that is shaken is shaken, we can find a place to hold on to God. And I know as Ruth's kind of been sort of meditating and praying about this sort of stuff, I'd just like her to come and pray on our behalves for that situation. She's going to America, she'd be all right. Norway's the place to go, actually, isn't it? Thanks, Dave. Um, I did actually phone Dave up on Friday and just said, you know, I, I try and um, pray every day for not only you guys in this church, but also the stuff that's going on in the world. And um, often I just read what's happening in the news just to keep tabs on what's going on. And I just phoned Dave on Friday and just said, Dave, you know, I really feel the church really needs to get up on, you know, and, and be praying for what's going on in Europe right now. And again, it's not because we want necessarily um, capitalism to keep flourishing, but actually I think there's a, a cry of mercy that we've got to ask God for right now in, in Europe. I, I sense that if things do go wrong, it's gonna, it, like Dave said, there could be a lot of um, extended poverty in our nation and in the rest of Europe. And, you know, in, in, even if it is a judgment of God, I believe that as people of, of sons and daughters of God, we can actually ask God for mercy instead of judgment. Yeah? Do you believe that? So I'm just going to pray. And, um, you know, we really need to, as a nation and as um, a European nation, really repent of, of our greed and you know the, the, all of the stuff that really Dave's been talking about tonight and and um, that's what I'm just going to pray for so if you can join with me and and if you're inspired by this tonight pray pray every day right now because it, the, the, we are on the edge of, of a crisis really so we need to be a praying church but Lord um, we come to you tonight Father, um, we come to you and we say to you, Lord, that we are in trouble. We're in trouble as a nation and we're in trouble as the nations of Europe. And Lord, um, we come to you in repentance and say to you, Father, that it's been because of this idol of mammon, greed, selfishness. We've ignored the poor. And we've heaped up debt upon our shoulders. And Lord, we come to you and we ask you, Lord, for mercy. We ask you, Lord, for more time. And Lord, we, we ask you for mercy, not so that we can continue, but we ask you for mercy so that you, Father, can do a deep work in our hearts. I'm reminded of that passage in Joel where it says, rend your heart, not your garments. And Lord, I pray there'll be a great rending of hearts in Europe, in the leadership structures, in the economic places of Europe in the homes, in family life, in government, will there be a rending of hearts, a great repentance, a repositioning of our minds, of our thinking, of our emotional connection to people who don't have money, who, who don't have wealth. Lord God, will you bring your wisdom Will you bring your insight? Will you bring your knowledge about how life is meant to work? And Lord, where we've been influenced and impacted by the wrong God in this nation, 
and in Europe, we repent, Lord, and we say, God, will you come and bring mercy to us? I pray, Father, for the leaders right now in Europe. Lord, will you position the right leaders in Europe right now as it's being shaken up? I pray, God, that you will raise up some righteous men and women who can come near to you and ask for your strategy and your wisdom. Lord, will you raise up a a prayer body in the church that's willing to stand in the gap too, I pray. Will you bring some stability just in this short time until, Lord God, we can see some godly resolutions come through? I pray this, Lord, in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. The really good news is that um, Jesus satisfies the things that materialism doesn't. And we, we, we most want to spend money when we're far from God. And when we're close to him, we most want to give money. You know, and there's, there's something about um, the, the presence of God which means I actually don't need the stuff that I thought I needed. Because you're my treasure. You really are enough. So we're going to finish just by a little bit of worship. And we'll just take um, five minutes really just to... Um, just to respond in worship. Then we'll call that the formal part of the evening finish.